All right, so I want to talk a little bit about faith. Yeah. I recently, like a huge chunk of the congregation I can't see because of the phone right there. Hello, everyone over there. Okay. Recently, I was in a discussion with someone about religion, about, and, um, he was attacking the veracity of the Christian faith, long story short, the trustworthiness of the scriptures, and so on and so forth, just, just going at it. One of the things that he said, that he, he just insisted on, was that faith, the whole idea of faith, of belief, is believing in something without evidence. You have faith because you can't know, you can't prove it, and so you have faith. I, he says, I don't have faith. I just, you know, I just believe what I've proved out and I've made sure that it's, it's true. I don't, I don't have faith. I don't have belief. Has he observed that? That, well, that would be a question, right? <laughs> so... First, first is an apologetic note, which is what Luke is driving at, which is, for him to say that, he, he doesn't, he's not, he's lying to himself. Long story short, he's lying to himself. We all, everyone has a faith presupposition. Everyone believes something, and for him, the thing that he's ultimately putting his trust in is his own discernment, his own ability, his own perfection of sight and understanding and reason. That is his final authority. And if it doesn't measure up to what I say and what I, what I think and what I believe, then it must not be true. That is his ultimate faith. And that's a foolish faith. There's no foundation for that. that you, you press that all the way down, there's, there's no ground level to that. It falls apart. The things that he does accept and believe, it, it's, he was, I don't remember the names of the books. He's like, the Bible is not trustworthy, but... There's these other, these other books that he believed in. There were three, and you've never even heard of them. Probably. I think there was one that I had heard of that it has like some, some Hindu-sounding name or something. And then two other texts that I'd never even heard of that he's like, you know, these, I've, these are the proven. They're just, the, okay, if they're that great, why does nobody know about them? It's a little bit interesting. You would expect that if they are that solid, that historically validated, that we would at least have heard about them. But at the end of the day, he's still got his faith in things. He's just rejected faith in Christ and in the Word of God. However, that discussion, for me, it's interesting analyzing my own thought processes because looking over the last couple weeks, I can see how the combination of that discussion and then anxiety over other things has pushed me into a season of doubt in my own heart between what he said and anxiety. And why, what does anxiety have to do with doubt? Well, everything. Anxiety is doubt in action. Anxiety is, why are you worried? You're worried because you don't believe that God will do what he says he will do. So anxiety is doubt, just with, with feet, with, with thoughts, with practical application. Just like joy is faith with practical application. When you're believing God's word, you walk out in the world and you interact with the world in a way that says Jesus is on the throne. When you're doubting God's word and then you walk out into the world and you encounter stuff, ah, what am I going to do? So, I want to talk about faith and what the Bible has to say about faith and how we respond to doubt as believers. First of all, his definition of faith is not a biblical definition of faith. It's not a right definition right. of faith. His definition of faith is that faith is blind, inherently, according to the dictionary. Faith is, well, frankly, I'm not really worried about what the dictionary defines faith as. I'm worried about what God defines faith as in his word. The dictionary can say what it wants, but scripture comes to us and presents a picture of faith that has two parts, at least the way I'm breaking it down today. One is an acknowledgement that we don't know everything. It really is a matter of belief. That is true. That is true. Which 
like we were talking about earlier, everybody has belief. Everybody has a foundational belief in something. The atheist has a belief in his own worldview structure, his own presuppositions. He, he assumes the existence of matter, and we assume the existence of God. Well, which one makes more sense? By far, it makes more sense that there was a creator God that spoke the world into existence. But everybody has a foundational faith. Nevertheless, the Bible doesn't shrink away from saying this is a matter of trust. This is a matter of, there is an actual faith element. So in defending the Christian faith, we don't defend it by saying, no, 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 there's no faith. It's all proven. It's all evidentiary. We can prove everything. Well, no, there's stuff we don't understand. There are questions that God does not answer. Are you okay with that? We have to be okay with that. That's how God chose to reveal himself. God could, d- could display himself and, you know, Jesus could reincarnate, or not reincarnate, that's wrong religion, but you know what, I, technically reincarnate, come in the flesh again and show himself to us over and over and over again in this kind of empirical proof. See, you've met me. Like he did to Thomas. Put your, put your hands and, you know, touch, touch my wounds. I'm here. I'm alive again. Right? He proved himself to Thomas. But then what did he say? He said, blessed are those who believe and have not seen. So, God gives us his word, and in his word he presents an idea of faith that isn't afraid to say, yeah, it is faith. I have not seen Jesus in the flesh. But I have seen the word of Christ. I have seen the work of Christ in others, in the world, in history. There's evidence everywhere. So that's the other part. Part number one is an acknowledgement. Yes, blessed are those who believe and have not seen. The Bible doesn't shrink away from the idea that this is a faith. At the same time, it's not a blind faith. It's not an irrational faith. It's not something that's a crutch that you just hold on to because it makes you feel better. In fact, the Bible rejects that idea. The Apostle Paul says, if this isn't true, if Jesus didn't actually come back from the dead, then we are of all men the most to be pitied. So Paul's perspective was not, well, hey, whether or not it's true, hey, it sure makes me feel better. Paul says, if, if it's not true, I'm wasting my time. So one, yes, it is a faith, but two, it's not a blind faith. Christianity is the most reasonable and the most necessary worldview. The world does not make sense apart from Jesus Christ. Amen. You cannot give an answer for reality apart from the word of God. You are lost, lost as a goose in a snowstorm. You can look at other religions and they get, you get closer, right? Atheism is just complete chaos. And then you get into other religions and you kind of filter through the other religions. And, okay, well, at least now if you believe in Allah, then there is an objective standard giver in your worldview. But then, then you start siphoning through the religions and doing your, um, your apologetic research and nothing comes close. At the end of the day, there's only one religion that says, our founder rose from the dead, and that's Christianity. So if you want to go somewhere else, may you be happy in the life, or rather the death, that you have chosen. But there's only one name by which man may be saved, and that is Jesus Christ. And that is pretty, it's pretty obvious when you do the digging. 1 John 1 is an example of how reasonable the Christian faith is. He talks about how this is what we have heard and seen and our hands handled. John's saying, I'm a witness I saw this stuff. You're reading an eyewitness account. And scripture is full of that. Scripture is full of that. Christian apologists have done all sorts of textual research and so on and so forth. There are very good arguments that support the Christian faith. So, scripture is afraid of neither faith nor evidence. Both of those are encompassed by the biblical idea of trusting in God and his word. So, then, how do we fight doubt. Um, before I, I just wanted to mention real quick one other thing that I was thinking about with, with the idea of God's word. If you look at the world, the world is enough to tell you that there was a, an intelligent designer behind everything that yes. we see. It's, it's ridiculous to look at the world and say that this was the result of a big accident. That doesn't make any sense at all. If you accept that, then the next question would be, who is this creator? Either he made it and left, and left us with nothing to, to know him, to see him, to understand him. In which case, 
you're pretty much as well off as just being an atheist because you're just left to try to figure out natural law on your own wisdom. Or he revealed himself. And if he revealed himself, what would you be looking for? You'd be looking for a book that was self-consistent, that was well-evidenced, and that claimed divine authorship. And that's what we find in the Word of God. Okay, so how do we fight doubt? Here are some practical ways to fight doubt when doubt arises. Number one is prayer. Mark 9.24, one of my favorite prayers in the Bible. This is a prayer to Jesus in conversation, but it's a prayer. Mark 9.23, and Jesus said to him, if you can... All things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Which is it? Yes. (laughs) It's both. And that, that is the prayer of the heart that's fighting doubt. Well, keep on praying. Lord, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Lord, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Why do we pray that? Well, because God's the one who gave the faith in the first place. The very fact that you're able to say that much is a gift from God. So keep praying. Lord, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Keep on praying. Fight in the prayer closet. Fight on your knees because we know, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, faith is a gift from God. So if you're wanting stronger faith, he's the one to ask. And he is a loving father who gives good gifts to his children. Number two, the word. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Okay, so you need some faith? Then get in the word. Why? Because it's not just a book. It's not just words on a page. If it's just words on a page, then what kind of sense does that make? I mean, maybe it'll be helpful, maybe not. Maybe you go look at a different book. But it's not just words on a page. It's living and active, sharper than any any two-edged sword. So get in the Word, because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. We see in the book of Psalms, David cries out to God, Why are you so far off, O Lord? So David himself seems to go through seasons of, I don't know if you want to call it doubt or distance from God, however you want to say it, and he returns to God. He cries out to God. He writes psalms, which are songs, in the midst of those moments. So from that I'm drawing out the idea that singing is another good way to fight doubt. Singing faithfully. Singing about Jesus. I'm not talking about singing the latest, you know, Taylor Swift song. Singing songs of worship to the Lord. Singing songs of doctrinal truth. Preaching it to yourself in song. Number four, fellowship. And not just, not just coffee and donuts fellowship, but heart fellowship. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. This is fellowship with the people of God that gets into the heart issues. Like, what are you struggling with? Struggling with doubt? How can I pray for you? Let's pray together. Let's, and then you can talk about it. You can wrestle through it. Okay? Galatians 6, 2. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. We're supposed to be in this together. So if you're struggling with doubt, or any other sin, who are your brothers and sisters in the trenches? Who is your church family? Who do you have on speed dial? Or, you know, hang out at, at the fellowship meal after, after service and talk about the stuff that really matters. Drill down to that heart level and bear one another's burdens. There's four practicals, prayer, the word, singing, and fellowship. So, don't be surprised by doubt. Don't let it throw you. The devil has been asking, hath God said since the beginning? One of the things I think that makes us susceptible temptation, to temptation is that it's so surprising to us. It's like, oh, why am I struggling with this? I thought I was saved. <laughs> yeah, you're struggling with this because you are saved. If you weren't saved, you wouldn't care. So don't be surprised. Like, oh, I'm doubting. Yeah. What did you think the devil was going to do? Why, why do you think you need a shield of faith? It's like, I'm getting shot at. Yeah. Uh-huh. He, God mentioned this. This was part of the job description. Don't be surprised by attacks of doubt. Number two, don't waste time focusing on your doubt. I am prone to introspection. And if you're like me, that's a great way to waste a lot of time. <laughs> So don't. Don't waste time focusing on your doubt. If you ha- so there's, there's two categories here. There's, there are actual doubts that are like an actual question. Like, okay, did Jesus really die on the cross? 
if that question is just burdening you and you're really wrestling with, did he die on the cross? Is there actual historical evidence? Then go research it. Jesus is not afraid of the truth. Jesus is the truth, and the truth has nothing to fear. So if you have an actual question, then go research it. This is not a matter of, oh, don't, don't ask questions. If you ask questions, you might mess up the, the uh, pyramid scheme we've got going on. <laughs> no, the, we believe God's word because God's word is true. There aren't questions that it can't answer. There are questions that it doesn't answer. There aren't questions that it can't answer. So if you have questions that are an, act, an actual real tangible question, then ask your question. But if it's not an actual tangible question, it's just like this nebulous sensation of not feeling faithish, <laughs> then don't waste time with that. Dismiss that. Don't play mind games with the devil. That makes him happy. If you don't feel faith, then believe anyway and keep on fighting. We're, we're, scripture presents belief as something we do, something we're supposed to do. Not something that just kind of, I, I, feel, I feel good. I feel like I have faith. I have to believe. Believe the word of God. Repent and believe the gospel. We're commanded to believe when you feel like it and when you don't feel like it. Keep on believing. Keep on fighting. Nehemiah 8.10, my verse for this. Nehemiah 8, 10. Ah, yes. Then he said to them, Go eat of the fat, drink of the sweet, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved, for the joy of Yahweh is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And if you are spending all your time playing mind games with the devil, your joy is gone. And you're weak. You're susceptible to temptation. The devil is, is happy. He's having a party. He doesn't have to make you fall into sin. If he can just get you stuck in your head... You're not a faithful soldier at that point. You're not an effective warrior on the battlefield. You're sitting there looking at your weapon, like cleaning your weapon and checking it out. Oh, what if this doesn't work? Oh, that part doesn't look right. And, and you're out of the fight. It doesn't matter. He's not concerned necessarily with making you actually join his side and start shooting at your, your comrades in arms. If he can just get you to hide out in your foxhole and spend all your time self-analyzing, he's got you out of the fight. That's not how we're called to live. So don't let him play mind games with you Reject that, focus on Christ, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, and run. Run the race. Keep on fighting. Remember, there is no alternative to Jesus Christ. Either he is the Lord or everything is ludicrous. John 6, 68, I love the disciples. Jesus said, are you going to leave too? And they say, where would we go? You have the words of life. So one of the questions when you're feeling those doubts, the question you can ask is, Okay, what is the alternative? Because there isn't one. There is no good alternative to Jesus Christ. Like, okay, so what, what, where are these doubts headed? Like, what, you, what am I, what's the alternative here? There's no, there's nowhere else to turn. There's no better option. Study the evidence, 1 Peter 3.15. Be ready to give an answer. It is good to get into the evidence. Another good thing that'll keep you from going down the rabbit hole, so those are the one I mentioned about the alternative, and then this other one. When you're getting in that rabbit hole of, oh no, this doubt, this yeah, evolution is true. Wow, evolution is true. Oh, I feel it. I feel the, the doubt. And the... Number one, there's no alternative to Jesus Christ. And number two, these are just two, two kind of like things to, to keep in the back of your head to keep you anchored. Look at the fruits, okay? Number one, what's, what's better than the truth of God's word in Christianity. Like, what is the better alternative? And number two, look at the fruits. You look at a bunch of these Christian, formerly Christian apostates who have left the faith, and they don't even know what a boy and a girl are anymore. And you're going to let them upset your faith? And I don't mean that as like, a, like an insult to them, but just to look, you will know them by their fruits. Like, you're really going to go to this person and expect them to lead you to truth? They can't, they can't see. They think math is white supremacy. It, they, they're lost. And it's heartbreaking, and it's sad. But 
Don't let them throw you. Look at the fruits. You, you're, uh, you're walk, you know, you've walked out of the orchard of Christianity with its towering redwoods, and you just walked out, and you know, there's this like crippled little grapevine laying on the ground. You're like, oh, I guess I was in the wrong forest all along. I want to come be with this guy. Like, no, so remember those two things. There's no good alternative to Christ. And look at the fruits. And at the end of the day, be at peace with trusting God. Even though he doesn't give us all the answers right now, his ways are higher than our ways, God calls us to childlike faith. And it's our own pride that insists on, no, I've got to understand it all. I've got to have all the answers. No, you don't. God never promises to give you all the answers. But he does say, be still and know that I am God. And I've given you enough. And if you leave after tasting and seeing, that's not on him. That's not because he wasn't good enough. It's not because he didn't give enough or prove enough or love enough. Or do enough. It's because we had a heart that was hard. And so we cry out to God to give us soft hearts. And at the end of the day, we trust Him. And we believe what we believe. Not because we get it. Not because we've proven it. There are evidences. It's not blind faith. But at the end of the day, it comes down to God said it. And I believe it. This is my foundational presupposition. For my life. Is right here. This is my, my yeah, my faith. It's in God. It's in Jesus Christ, revealed in Scripture. And at the end of the day, we've got to be at peace with saying, Thus saith the Lord, and that's good enough for me.